this type and uh, I'll take the opportunity to welcome everyone and uh, thank you for all participating and hopefully you'll send in some questions my experience as uh, an academic is predicated on the students being involved in an interactive way and I have given lectures I find it usually less of a success because the students don't get the answers and I'm sometimes missing the targets so I'll encourage everyone to take advantage of uh, I guess relatively new technology here to, to immediately send questions in and I, they'll either be commuted verbally or we may revert to something fancy like file cards to get them from one end of the table to the other uh, Julia may chime in with some comments and suggestions and help me with some of these answers we have the opportunity or the advantage here that uh, Julia is, is uh, recently admitted to the practice of law. She has prepared much of the work here, and I've done the editing and revising, and uh, we've put this together uh, jointly. If you do have questions, you can freely submit them to either one of us. We're going to talk about business entities, and we're really going to try and do this in a way that, um, to the extent I can read into the people who have signed up and where they've signed up from, will address um, issues that I think you're likely to see. So we are going to address entities um, in some respects from the simple to the complex, but also historically from the earliest to be formed to those that are more recent creations uh, of statute. And um, there are advantages and disadvantages to any business form. The most basic legal form that you'll see and we'll punch this up and see if we can do this, um, the, is a sole proprietorship. We will talk about corporations, general partnerships, limited partnerships, limited liability companies, and some other business forms. I don't want you to think that this is an exclusive list, and the reasons to use some of them that I will go over is, is necessarily only a partial list of the advantages and the disadvantages. But um, the key differences that we're going to talk about will relate to the number of people which uh, work successfully in one particular entity or form or structure uh, versus another, issues that arise out of transferability of interests, um, the issue of, of liability, to the extent to which um, if you are the owner, you have liability for your conduct and that of other people who are working for you. Uh, the, the fact that some business entities are particularly receptive to carving up both ownership and control, separating ownership from control, and other business entities are not as receptive to that. And uh, while I would be the last one to tell you I knew much about taxes, since I don't even do my own tax return, we'll at least touch on a couple of those issues. Um, the, the aggregate is a situation which probably um, is a, an issue that anybody who's starting a business is going to look at. Well, what are the pros and the cons here versus here, and which one works best for me? I, I would say to you in that regard that there are two areas of uh, professional advice that you may, uh, if you can afford it, want to get. If you can't afford it, you may want to get a little free legal advice or free accounting advice. Those are the two areas. And, and many attorneys will at least do a, a little bit of free consultation. We certainly do that from time to time if people contact us. I know that some accounting firms will do that and, and others won't. Um, the oldest, most fundamental concept of a a business entity is a sole propart, uh, proprietorship, also sometimes referred by, by the phrase people use in lay terms, it's a DBA. You get out of the county clerk's office and you pay a filing fee that uh, shockingly I think is still in single digits. I think it's $8 in New York, but, but I, I can't, I, I wouldn't guarantee that, but it's very little money. It's uh, also uh, very limited in terms of what happens. You are filing a registration of a name, and it is you, um, but in, in a different name. Uh, it's still you. If you it, a sole proprietorship by its nature, by the name sole, it's, it is just you. If uh, you and your brother, or you and your wife, or you and your friend want to start a business, you can't be a sole proprietorship. Um, you also, therefore, can't transfer 
the business as such as a sole proprietor to someone else. You can sell the assets, you can sell perhaps the goodwill, you can, you can do certain things to transfer certain of the, of the um, characteristics of the business, but the business itself can't be transferred. The kind of business that we tend to see as a sole proprietorship um, might be a, uh, a corner convenience store. I wouldn't recommend that a corner convenience store be a sole proprietorship, but it is that kind of very small uh, coffee shop or um, uh, convenience store. Uh, it's a good opportunity, as I say that, uh, to address one of the significant disadvantages that you find with a sole proprietorship. Um, using the coffee shop or the convenience store as an example, if you start one of those businesses and you go out to get liability insurance, you'll find that selling food carries with it a high insurance premium because the risks are substantially greater than in some other forms of business. And if you are a sole proprietor, all of those risks sit with you. And so if you were to go to most professionals, I think you would find that they would say, this is not a good place to be a sole proprietor because of the fact that someone gets food poisoning, they slip on a grape, there are significant risks. Other places where you might find someone as a sole proprietor, sometimes the even filing the, um, uh, somebody sent me a message that's $31. Ah, so the price has gone up since the last time I went and had somebody file. The message in that is, I do everything I can to keep people from filing DBAs because I just think it's an invitation to trouble. But what I did start to say was, you might find someone who's a consultant um, who files a DBA. Um, I used to practice law with an attorney in town who, notwithstanding my advice to him to the contrary, not as his lawyer but as his friend, that he should form an entity practicing law as a DBA. If, if he has a problem, it's all him and nobody else. Um, the the uh, contribution to capital, that is, you want to start a business, you got to put some money in to get it started. And there is no way to have more than your own capital invested in a sole proprietorship. You can borrow money, and, uh, and many people do. Uh, I would say that from my experience, when people come to me and they've started a business and they're already a sole proprietorship, more often than not, the form of the debt is among the most, if not the most expensive forms of debt there is, they've, they've put it on their credit card. They've run up ten or $15,000 of credit card debt and now they've got this business going and they're going to change the form of the business because someone told them that they should do that. In terms of the tax aspect of a sole proprietorship, there is a separate schedule on your 1040, but it's your income, it's your loss, they're your expenses. You have certain characteristics of the preparation of the return that will isolate the business, but the sole proprietorship income is going to be part of your individual uh, tax return. Um, it's a very much do-it-yourself situation from the filing of the DBA to doing the business. And um, it, it means that it can be very difficult to raise money because you're only going to raise money. The business is, is, is you and that's it. And you can't be sharing the profits of the business in any very easy way. So um, there, there isn't much uh, by way of, of what you can offer other than debt to someone who you want to have help you with the, with the infusion of money to run the business. The other thing about a sole proprietorship that, that I would suggest to you and from my experience makes them problematic is mentally it's very hard for a sole proprietor to separate her or his um, thoughts of expenses and income from the individual. Um, again, a rather mundane example when I many years ago started my own law firm and I set it up as a separate corporation, I spent $700 on a chair. I would never have spent $700 on a chair at my house at the time, way too much money. But I knew that I needed to create a certain business image 
the chair. I needed to have certain characteristics. It needed to wear well. And I spent money thinking about it as a business and the business's expense rather than it being my money, albeit at the end of the day, I owned 100% of the business that was mine. Um, sure. Okay. Would you advise an entrepreneur to register as a DBA for the sake of securing a name? And if so, how difficult would it be later to establish um, as an LLC or corporation? Well, um, in terms of the name, you can, you can in fact register the name, but you do not necessarily get very much protection from that. If you have a name that you want to protect, you should look at uh, the issue of copyright and, um, and uh, registering the name as a trademark. Copyright generally would be for the descriptive materials under the name, the um, trademark or service mark is going to give you protection but if you're going to start a business uh, first of all it, it isn't necessarily going to protect you uh, at all it may establish a date when you begin to use the name if someone subsequently tries to use it but you may not be able to maintain exclusivity Julia's nodding up and down. You want to add something? Well, I mean, we have a client now who's been in operation for 40 years and never trademarked the name, and now basically can't trademark the name because it's already been taken. So it's created a whole series of, uh, of problems for this company. So trademarking is very important in addition to establishing the entity, however you do it, as a DBA or an LLC. Yeah, the, the, the issue of trademark is one that I think many, even many attorneys who are advising people who are starting businesses don't focus on. Partly because from a historical standpoint, um, businesses tend to stay geographically in a, in, a, in a smaller area than they probably do now. And New York was uh, obsessive compulsive about not letting people have different, uh, the same name or almost the same name. But that's not the case anymore. It, if the name is, is very similar, unless it's identical, the state will take your money. And they, they just, somebody made a decision a few years ago that they were not going to get into the business of deciding. So um, I, I think it's fair to say um, I, I used to have a client uh, that was uh, Adirondack and Anesthesia Services, and some people in Glens, Glens Falls started a company called Adirondack Anesthesiologists. And trust me when I tell you that the reimbursement problems for the insurance companies were wonderful because it's only the first 16 letters that they look at when they go to do the cut the check and they were identical. Um, we did successfully resolve that but uh, it's a good example of you need to, to deal with the trademark issue. You may well, if you're going to grow a business, want to be in Pennsylvania or Arizona or someplace where what New York does doesn't help. And while there are certain intellectual property registrations, by the way, that you can do on a state level, I would strongly recommend that you protect your intellectual property with the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office, so you register the name there. And that's a separate issue. Whether you are doing it as a sole proprietorship, partnership, or any of these other entities, even if you have a corporation, you need to do it separately. Do we have another question? There is another question. If an individual does business in more than one county, does it have to register the DBA in each county? Uh, well, New York has, of course, because they don't know how to make things simple, they make them more interesting. You can register in, in multiple counties, or instead of filing a DBA with the county clerk, you can file an assumed name certificate with the state of New York and then check the boxes as to how the counties you're going to do business in, and having already said, I don't think you ought to be using a sole proprietorship under most circumstances, I would at the very least suggest that you register at the state level and then, you know, if you're in um, Jefferson County, make sure you have Hamilton covered and St. Lawrence covered and the, the counties around you and you may want to review this from time to time and, and add to the list. Um, so let me, if, if I can, proceed to the issue of the general partnership. A, 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 um, a, a, there we go. General partnership um, is, is uh, if not as old as a sole proprietorship, nearly as old. And a general partnership can come into existence by Julia and Jim deciding that we're going to start a business called, uh, you know, Julia and Jim's Sporting Goods. 
and uh, we shake hands and we go out and we find a place to put our business and we put a sign up and we're in business. And when we do that, we buy all of the wonderful advantages and disadvantages that we didn't write anything down, we didn't tell anybody about it, but it is still a general partnership. If we've agreed we're going to form a partnership, then the default provisions of that are we're 50-50 owners, we share equally in the assets, equally in the liabilities, equally in the risks so that when Julia is out on company business and she gets in an accident, and I can be sued because she's doing the business of a general partner and I may be none too happy about that. Um, separating out a couple of the comments that I've just made, um, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to say that for any business form, a written agreement um, is like I think it was Mr. Frost who said that good fences make good neighbors and good written agreements are, are hugely advantageous. Um, a partnership agreement is a form of a contract. I would, I would say to you that many, many years ago someone explained to me the difference between an American contract and a British contract. An American contract is a description of the costs of not doing what you said you would do, whereas a British contract is a description of the commitments you made to do things. You do not want to be in a contract, in a partnership with someone where you think it's a matter of cost but it is my experience that at least everybody I've known has an imperfect memory. We sit down and we talk about something. We make the deal three years from now. I thought we were doing it this way. Julia thought we were doing it that way. We're both being completely candid and honest. We just don't remember. Um, also, at some point, at least so far, everybody dies. And if there is a partnership agreement that defines the relationships, then if I die, Julia can look at it and say to my wife, here's the deal. We wrote this down and we signed it. We worked out the terms of the relationship. We are both equally liable for all of the a assets and the liabilities. It's a 50-50 deal. It says so right here. Um, a, a, a general partnership any, a person who is a partner in a general partnership can, subject to the terms of a partnership agreement, uh, have unlimited ability to control and to bind and to make decisions. So if you're going to have a relationship where um, you don't want that, I don't want Julia going out and buying uh, a, a Lexus SUV that's been pulled off the market yesterday. Uh, because I, that's not in our budget, we should have some agreement. Now, obviously, we should have some agreement as well as to what we're going to be spending money on, right, Julia? Yeah. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> but, um, but a clear set of the terms of the deal and who is going to do what, who is going to be responsible for purchasing, who is going to be responsible for marketing. Um, and I will tell you, by the way, that businesses with more, with several owners that are new businesses that start up have a higher success rate than sole proprietorships. Um, the management of a general partnership generally is in the hands of the general partners. General partnerships can today be very, very large businesses. We're doing some work in, in involving uh, general partnerships that have assets in um, eight or nine decimal places. But most of the time, general partnerships are, are not that kind of business. They tend to be smaller. They tend to be more intimate. People um, who practice law sometimes refer to them as, a, as being much like a marriage because of the fact that you can impose liability on each other. Um, your stupid decisions are not you know, just going to punish you, but punish your partner as well. Um, the problem of raising money in a sole proprietorship is much the same as in a general partnership. Keeping in mind that the issues of control and of management and of um, all of the pieces of a general partnership rest 100% with each of the general partners, it becomes more difficult to raise 
uh, capital in, other than in the form of a loan. You can't raise any money because as soon as someone puts money in as an owner, they, they are necessarily, by definition, a general partner. And someone might well be willing to, to lend you some money, but they may not be willing to place all of their assets at risk when you go out and you invent the, the next best thing and you run up a lot of debt for, for the entity. So um, partnerships are not particularly good ways, generally speaking, to, to raise capital. There, again, a, as with uh, many of these things, there are certainly are exceptions to that general concept, but there's a general rule that the partnership is uh, more difficult to, um, to use as a vehicle to raise money. And as we will see, it does not lend itself to a separating um, management from uh, sharing in the profits and sharing in the risks. If, if you think of most, um, most businesses today, there is somebody who is a manager of the business, whether it's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company or it is a store manager of a particular store, the, the owner is usually not the person there. Sometimes we want the CEO to have a large shareholding interest or ownership interest in the business. We want them to be invested in the business, both financially and, and psychologically. So we want them to be owners, but they don't need to be owners. And someone who has the ability to invest may not have the ability to run the business. Someone has the ability to run the business may not have resources. So a general partnership um, has the disadvantage of it being difficult to separate out those two kinds of skills. Um, some of you may uh, be scientists, uh, techies, geeks, whatever the, 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 the phrase is, and you may have great technology and great knowledge in specific fields. You may not know how to run a business you, as, as part of the capital of the business that you bring to the table, um, may be your technical expertise, it may be a patent you have, it may be some uh, particular skill that is not the ability to run a business, to supervise uh, a sales force, to do marketing. And so you want to be able to recruit those kinds of skills. It's more difficult to do that in a, in a general partnership and it's particularly difficult to do that, and, and I'm not saying it's impossible, but rather more difficult to give incentives to people who you bring in. You, you find somebody who's going to be able to sell the software product that you have developed, um, the, the internet website, better than anybody else, and you want to incentivize uh, that woman by giving her an opportunity to own part of the business so that, that when you go on the, the New York Stock Exchange listing, uh, she becomes fabulously wealthy, and in a general partnership structure, that's very difficult to do. So um, it, it is, it, it is a, an entity that has some disadvantages. What, one of the advantages that a, that a partnership, general partnership has is that, that there are, is not double taxation. As I said, I, I do my standard disclaimer repeatedly on my my knowledge of the tax law, but I will tell you the general partners share in the, the income and the expenses of the partnership, of a general partnership. If the partnership makes money, it doesn't get taxed and then distribute money to the, to the owners. The, the income and expenses effectively get passed through as a schedule on your 1040 return, and you then pay the taxes or enjoy the losses I use the term enjoy somewhat advisedly, but, but you get the deduction of the losses uh, because the partnership is not a separately taxed entity. Um, this Julia's red dotted line uh, lays out the, the separation, and as you can see, the, tax, the earnings are taxed as ordinary income to, to the partners in, in uh, in connection with their percentages of, of ownership. Um, one of the 
other advantages of a general partnership is that it can be, and I think we say here it is less expensive to form. I would, let me take a minute and, and, and address that. Um, if three or four people come in and they want to form a, a business and uh, we are going to set up agreements for the four individuals there might be a buy-sell agreement where they are going to decide what happens if somebody dies, what happens if somebody leaves the business, what happens if we find out you're stealing from us, what happens if. It's, it's a, a shareholder agreement is a, is a document that we've probably done a thousand times, five thousand times at Green and Seifter. It's, it's a, it is a uh, a document that there is a lot of experience with because it happens often in the corporate structure and in, 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 in the LLC structure as we'll talk about though less so than with the, with the corporation simply because LLCs haven't been around as long but partnerships are the partnership agreement tends to uh, because it's it's more personal and somehow a more intimate relationship take more time and sometimes have more nuances to it than uh, maybe a, a shareholder agreement. Again, it's sort of a generalization, but it's my experience that when partners sit down and they try and write these things all out, for whatever reason, they seem to have a harder time doing it than if, we, if we're using a different business form. Maybe that's a function of the people, maybe that's a function of me, but that has been my experience in helping people to form uh, partnerships that may also be because they will come in and say we already formed our partnership a year ago and now we want to write this up and and so there is already a history there are already issues somebody's already got a health issue as opposed to people who um, are forming a different kind of a business entity as I say some of the ones that we we'll get to in a minute where they probably have not done that um, let me let me uh, proceed to uh, limited partnerships. Um, limited partnerships were, were a, a 20, 30, 40 years ago uh, evolution or re revision of the general concept of a partnership. They have um, an, no limit as to the number of people who can participate. Um, I think early on in the history of limited partnerships the the general partners needed to be individuals but that's certainly not the case any longer the the limited partnership um, imposes on investors people who want to take an equity position in the business um, a, a fixed dollar amount with a limitation on their liability and a limitation generally on their obligations to come up with more capital to continue the business. So these vehicles were used 60s, 70s, 80s have, uh, at least from my experience, uh, uh, fallen into disfavor. They're just not used as much because other entities seem to work better for, for most of the purposes, particularly limited liability companies. But there were general, there were in our general partners who have general and unlimited liability, they're charged with running the business, there are limited partners who have limited liability, generally speaking, they are not charged with running the business and they don't have liability, but they also tend to, will normally have a cap on what they're going to get back. The general partner may have, have the unlimited liability and will also have the unlimited upside potential. Um, it, I, I think those are those are the principal differences between a general partnership and a limited partnership. Um, again, the their tax implications are essentially a pass through. Um, I don't know whether you have other things that you're thinking of. The only other thing I was thinking of is that a limited partner, even if they are only a limited partner in the ar agreement, may make themselves a general partner if they take too much management control in the operation of the business. So that's something to be careful of if you want to just be an investor in something if you're a limited partner. Yeah, notwithstanding the fact that you've, you, you have an agreement among the partners 
these six people are limited partners, these two people are general partners. If the limited partner proceeds to act as a general partner, for example, um, you go out and you raise $100,000 and one limited partner puts up 75000 of the 100 and now things aren't going well and steps in and says, I'm, I'm stepping in here because I got a lot more money at risk than the rest of you people. As to the rest of the world, that person who takes control and starts to act as the general partner, uh, you know, may buy the may buy the farm. They may, may be treated by the law based upon their conduct vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it, it's a risk, um, and it, it may be one of the reasons why that and the fact that, as I said, there are some other entities that seem to work better. Um, limited partnerships. I, I, I mean, I haven't formed one in a long time. Uh, the firm may have, but, but I haven't. Um, in a limited partnership, the general partners have 100% of the liability in excess of the investment, as I said. There may also be specific uh, responsibilities for specific general partners. Uh, limited partnerships w may have a provision for a tax partner who is responsible there's a general partner, but it has the responsibility for addressing tax issues and making decisions that, that involve the uh, compliance with, with tax laws. And there can be other provisions like that. Um, corporations uh, are next on our list here. And um, I would say that when most people think of business, they think of corporations that, that may not be fair or even accurate, but I think that that's the perception of most people who uh, come in contact with business. If you uh, look at the publicly traded stock in the United States, it represents a very large percentage of the wealth of the country, and those companies, for the most part, are corporations. And um, as a matter of fact, for the most part, when you're talking about publicly traded companies, those corporations are formed in uh, only a few states, the predominant state being Delaware. Delaware um, is the, the location of choice for many business entities. As a person who does a lot of litigation, one of the things that, that I am acutely aware of is that that judges like the rest of us have areas of greater knowledge and less knowledge. Delaware prides itself on a judiciary that's particularly knowledgeable about corporate and business matters. And so many corporations will see that as, a, as an advantage if there are shareholder disputes, if there are certain kinds of disputes, they will go to the Delaware Chancery Court. Um, New York is blessed with a particularly uh, fine group of judges we, we have, I would say, um, a more sophisticated bench than, than many states do because we've been a center of commerce for a very long time. And that has allowed for the evolution of a lot of skill both in the legal community and on the bench. So uh, corporations, many people in New York will just go ahead and, and form a New York corporation where in some other state they might choose to use a Delaware entity. We form corporations in, in New York and Delaware. I can't say that we don't do it in other states. We probably do. But overwhelmingly, we would be forming entities in those two states. Um, one of the things that's most important about a corporation is its ability to carve up the indicia of ownership so that the people who are running the business, the people who are um, enjoying the profits of the business, the people who um, are making certain kinds of decisions can all be separated out. You can have, you can even have different levels of ownership, which you know are referred to as uh, different classes of stock: preferred stock, common stock, convertible stock. Common stock is, in the simplest of terms, an ownership interest, uh, a, a simple percentage of ownership, and a preferred stock would have certain preferential rights. Um, it might have a preference so that it, it got its dividend before the common stock got a dividend if one was declared. There can be cumulative preferred stock, which would mean you can't, nobody who has common stock can get a dividend until all of the previous year's dividends that weren't paid are caught up. 
you can have stock that's preferred convertible to common. So you start out as preferred stock, but if the company is doing well, oftentimes the structure of a corporation means that more of the upside rests with the common stockholders because the preferred stockholders have less risk. They'll get paid out in bad times more readily. Um, not going to begin to try and go into all the differences. There are semester courses here at the law school on, on just on corporations. But what I'm really trying to say is a lot of flexibility, a lot of choice, and a lot of ability to separate out different ways of dividing up the traditional ideas and the characteristics of, of owning a business. Also an easy way to go out and to raise money. When people come to me and they've started a business, they've usually started the business and they've raised money among family and friends. And you can at least say to your grandmother or your mother or your, you know, your sister who's going to invest in your business, I'm going to give you a piece of the action. You get part of the ownership of the business. I'm going to give you some stock in this company that I'm forming. Um, you can set up, I recently looked at a situation where a company has 5.15 billion shares of stock. New York, generally, people start with 200. It's a big difference. But they have one thing in common. It's 100%. No matter how many shares, there's only 100% you can divide up. If you're starting a business, husband those percentages. Be very reluctant to give them out because as you move forward, if you're, you know, businesses do three things. They either get better, they get worse, or they stay the same. If they get better, they need more money because they need to be they need to raise money to expand the business. If they get worse, they need more money because they need it to survive. The company that limps along just limps along and doesn't need any more money. You don't want to be that business, so you know all likelihood you're going to need to raise money either to turn the business around in its early days or to keep it alive or to grow the business. So you want to be very, very reluctant to give out those percentages of ownership. And there are going to be a lot of people out there who are going to put their hands out. There are going to be people who are investors. There's going to be that woman who does the best marketing in the world who you need to come in and help sell that software. There's going to be a chief financial officer and he's really going to want a piece of this action too. And you need to be very careful about that. Also early on in the development of a corporation, I would say keep it as simple as you can because as, as you, you progress, at times you will necessarily have to make it more complicated and you want to avoid that because as you get investors in, the simpler the structure, the easier it is to meet the needs of those people who want to come in and invest in, in the business and want to participate or who you want to arm twist and cajole and persuade to come in. So you want to have a structure that's easy to work off of. Um, Corporation absent agreements to the contrary, and, and I'll get to that in just a minute, have shares of stock that are freely transferable. I can give some of my stock to Julia. Now, that said, um, there, are, there are several overlays on that general concept. If I go out and start selling stock in my, my company, uh, that uh, you know, my traditional company when I, when I teach at the law school is fly-by-night airlines. So if, fly by, if I form fly-by-night airlines and um, I want to go out and sell stock to, to Julia, then the experience of the Depression uh, propagated a series of laws that are intended to limit and control the sale of securities. And I'm going to have to be careful not to run afoul of those as I sell those shares, whether it's 200 shares or whether it's 2 million shares. I uh, may well be subject to the federal securities laws. And to some extent, New York and other states have what are called blue sky laws, although um, there, there have been some discussions that the federal law in some ways may supersede them. By the way, the reason they're called blue sky laws is that they were attempting to prevent people from selling pieces of blue sky to little old ladies and widows and orphans. And uh, so hence the, the name, or that's uh, what I've been told why they're called blue sky laws. Um, the, the, that's the first piece of information to file away. You just can't go out and take your two million shares, run around to everybody in New York, Pennsylvania, you know, New Jersey, and, and be, be selling pieces of the action without getting some advice from somebody to keep yourself from running afoul of the, uh, particularly the federal securities laws. But in addition, when you form a business, 
as I said, you're more likely to be successful if you have several people who are participating and you want to have some control um, amongst yourselves. Um, you know, if Julie and I start a business, um, maybe she doesn't want me to be giving a piece of the business to one of my children or to my wife who become owners. I hand over all those shares that I have to my wife and I walk away and all of a sudden she's stuck in business with somebody. Have you met Marcy? I don't even no. know. Never even met. <laughs> um, and, and so she may want to have, and I may want in the same way, to have restrictions. I don't want her to be selling her shares to somebody who might prove to be a competitor or might be somebody who I already know and, and, and don't like or don't trust. I don't want to be in business with. And so people, when they start businesses, will tra traditionally have several sets of documents that they'll at least look at doing. They'll have a shareholder agreement that, sh that restricts as, as the partnership agreement can do in a partnership, uh, the transferability of the shares that everybody who signs on agrees to. There can be an employment agreement. If, if you are the, um, the inventor, the patent, or the, the genius behind the company, the company may want to have an exclusive employment arrangement with you. The company may want to own the intellectual property, although you may want to only license the intellectual property in case the business doesn't do well. It's a question that requires attention when you're starting a business, particularly with, with a, a technology base. So you may want to have employment agreements, you may want to have shareholder agreements, and within the employment agreements, you may want to have certain kinds of non-compete agreements. New York will recognize and allow people to enter into agreements that, that, that have some limitation on their ability to compete if, as a general rule, they're reasonable as to the duration, geographic, uh, area covered and uh, the scope of the of the expertise. If you're a uh, copy or repair person and that's the business you go into, then an agreement not to, to repair any kinds of office equipment might well not be enforceable, but an agreement not to compete in doing copy repair might be enforceable. And geography can be quite large. There are cases involving people who sell munitions and the marketplace is the world. And so there are cases where the world is deemed to be a reasonable geographic description. Um, one of the things that you can do with a corporation that, that is not um, a vehicle easily applied to um, the other forms we've talked about is you can bring in expertise both full-time and part-time. I encourage people to set up a board of directors that's a real board of directors if they want to grow a business. If, you, if, you, if, if what you want to do is to open up a convenience store, you may not want to get people to come and be on your board as aggressively. You've been running one for years, you work for somebody else who ran one, you never want to have two, you want to have one. If that's your goal, that's one kind of board of directors. That can be a couple of people in the family. But if you want to grow a business, getting some people in who have grown a business and compensating them or getting them invested, whether, whether it's monetarily or psychically, in the business has um, much to recommend it. And people who have done it before will come in and they may be willing to sit on your board of directors because it's a couple of hours once a month. Maybe it's three hours on a Saturday. And they enjoy the experience. You may compensate with them with some money or more likely if you're starting a business, you don't have much money with some very, very, very small percentage shares of, of stock in the company because if they come in early, they see an opportunity. If they think you're smart and you have a good idea, you also can bring in people who are the officers of the company. The officers of the company are the people who generally will be binding the company by their signatures. They'll be making the day-to-day -day business decisions. In a corporation, the shareholders, the owners are going to elect the board of directors. They may also elect the officers, but also the, the, the directors can elect the officers. As a general rule, the board of directors is going to set large-scale policy, the direction of the business, the vision of the business. The officers are going to carry out that vision and they're going to bring it to reality. A person can be a shareholder and an officer and a director, but not necessarily. So you can carve those pieces up. Um, there are... Um, there are two general tax structures for corporations. I need to make a correction. 
that I, I made here. It says taxation of subchapter C corporations, and we'll get to a second to subchapter to, to, to S corporations. They are actually now called C corps and S corps. There's no subchapter reference, um, but a, a C corporation is a reference to provisions in the Internal Revenue Code. The Internal Revenue Code uh, treats a corporation as a separate taxpayer who's going to be paying taxes unless the corporation um, chooses to be an S corporation. And there are a lot of restrictions on what types of corporations can be S corporations. But one of the issues is that because the corporation is a separate legal entity, it is separately taxed. And, and, and that means that as you look at the op options for an, a corporation, you need to recognize that. There are ways to manage and address the tax issues. Same caveat, same disclaimer, not my area, and not something we're going to cover in the amount of time that we have. Um, I, I would say, and I think I'll go back and see if we can go back and say it. When I'm talking about corporations, generally, corporations are good at as vehicles to raise money because you can separate management and control and liability and investment and, and investment dollars and the share opportunity to share on the upside potential. So corporations are particularly well suited. It's why, as I said, you see so many of them as being that is the vehicle that you find as a matter of, of common practice in publicly traded companies. Um, they can they can issue bonds and notes and convertible bonds and and so they have a, a wide variety of vehicles for that purpose let me interrupt and say we started a little bit later we're going to finish at one or are we going to go a little bit past it's being 10 of now for people who are looking at their watches and didn't bring them with them well uh, i think i know that they there may be people may want to ask questions so so we'll 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 go quickly through the other so yeah yeah, well, people should be sending their questions in as, as they go along. Um, I did talk, I did, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the difference between a C Corp and an S Corp, but, but to simply say that, um, that the S Corporation can have some of the characteristics of a partnership in terms of passing through um, certain air income and expenses net numbers to the owners of the business. It's a question that you should ask when you meet with a tax professional or you meet with your attorney. And, and um, having just said, feel free to send questions in. Don't bother to send questions in about S Corps and C Corps unless Julia is going to answer them because I'm not going to. Um, since we are going to send, save a little bit of time to talk about the, the, the questions at the end, I do want to move along to limited liability companies. Um, limited, a limited liability company is, is something of a, a, uh, a hybrid entity that is the creation of statutory law that began, my guess is 50 years ago, but, but really came into vogue substantially more recently than that. 30 years ago. New York has had limited liability companies for a shorter period of time than, than many other um, states. They, this means from a practical standpoint that there is less case law, less judicial decision making about what things mean in the limited liability company statute. What um, it means when a limited liability company agreement among the members um, says something, then you will find in the corporate setting. And so there are certain inherent risks uh, the, the, that arise from that. Courts have been uh, interpreting what it means to be a corporation for the history of the United States and not so for limited liability companies. That said, the, among the things they have in common with a corporation is that there are there is no limitation on the number of uh, owners um, the the transferability and when I talked earlier the corporation about restrictions in terms of shareholder agreements um, an operating agreement can be entered into among the members which is the term that's used for limited liability companies as to transferability do you want to chime in with anything about transferability or, or liability on L the term is LLCs 
Um, well, I mean, as far as the liability, it, it really has the best of both worlds because it protects the people who come into the uh, to the organization um, to the amount of money that they've put into the organization rather than their personal assets. So there's a level of protection. Um, but from a tax standpoint, it's treated uh, like a partnership. partnership. Yeah, that's so you get to pass that. through, you don't get double taxation, and, um, and, and, and sometimes it's not to your advantage, but often it's to your advantage to uh, pass through the tax consequences. Limited liability companies are frequently seen in real estate projects because the depreciation passes through along with the income. Uh, so there are, there are almost, I would say, as a matter of course today, people, if they're buying a, a piece of real estate as an investment, they put it in an LLC, don't mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, yeah I've seen that a lot. Um, uh, you, you will find it's probably not quite as easy to raise capital as it will be with a corporation. Partly it's a matter of an entity being around for hundreds of years that, that a str as a structure, people have learned all kinds of ways to slice and dice you know, warrants and options and classes of stock in the, in the corporate setting. The limited liability company, um, you probably can slice and dice it a little less easily or you're going to find fewer people who have the expertise. Um, if you came to see me and you wanted to do some complicated structure for an LLC, i take you to see Phil Bousquet or maybe Larry, somebody, somebody else in the office. I wouldn't do that, but we have people who do it. But, but uh, when I had my own firm, I would have then referred the work to, frankly, I probably would have referred it to Green and Seifter. I joined Green and Seifter about a year and a half ago after having been sending lots of business across the street, and they sent me lots of business across the street. We came up with the idea that we shouldn't be across the street anymore. But, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of attorneys will be less comfortable with a limited liability company as a structure, and there are some um, subtleties and vagaries in limited liability companies that really command uh, expertise. We've had a discussion in the office recently. Um, in a corporation, if you don't write up a shareholder agreement, you still have a valid corporation. We've had a discussion about that issue with regard to limited liability companies, and the statute talks about some of those issues, and they, they become far more, um, more subtle, but no less important. And, and sometimes people may not focus on them as they're starting up. So someone who is particularly skilled with the formation of a limited liability company is, in, at least in my opinion, something that's critically important. One of the things, by the way, historically that precipitated the formation of the limited liability company was I talked about the S Corp, but used to be the subchapter S Corp, and there were some changes in the taxing of that entity that precipitated people saying, well, we need to find a, a structure that's going to work a little bit better, and the limited liability company was, was sort of an evolution of that. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and I want to just throw out very quickly that there are a few other forms of business entities in New York. Um, the the uh, professional corporation for doctors, attorneys, which is a corporation, but can but and, and is limited in who can be an owner. Um, it, they must be licensed professionals in the particular field. There are professional limited liability companies, which are much like limited liability companies, but only for professionals. And uh, I learned this week, in fact, that you can have a professional limited liability company and call it um, an, an LLC instead of a PLLC. News to me on Monday. Um, and there are some other even more esoteric uh, and, and distinct areas. For example, In the banking field, you can have a national association that is a creation of federal law. All of the things we've been talking about up till now have been creations of state law, and each of the 50 states has their own set of rules, protocols, and procedures as to how you form them, how many shareholders there can be, or what the, what the taxes and the charges may be. Um, and then there are a couple of, of uh, small areas, like banking, where you can have either a state bank or a national bank. If you see uh, N period A period after the name of a bank, it's a nationally char chartered bank. It has different supervisors on the regulatory side and um, some of the same in some different regulatory environments. There are other, if you want to become even more esoteric, the Red Cross is a chartered by Congress. 
Um, there may be a couple of other entities chartered by Congress. Uh, I'm not sure about Fannie Mae. It, it, it's uh, changed forms in light of its financial difficulties a couple of years ago. But, but generally speaking, when you are forming a business, you need to think about it as a creation of state law subject to state rules and procedures, um, and, and not so much um, on the federal level. I, Bring my slides, catch, catch the slides up there. Yeah, I, um, I would also say that um, I think it's true, I don't have any documentation, that in the last dozen years, the method du jour for people to form business entities is to go online, get a set of forms, fill them out online, file them online, and you have a corporation. And um, from the standpoint of a practicing attorney, you would think I would think that's a terrible idea and because uh, I can't make any money on that. And in some ways, at least the first part of it is true. Um, my experience is we don't charge a whole lot to form a business for people. When it comes to doing that shareholder agreement, there's some money in that and expense that you're going to incur. The buy-sell agreement, the restrictive agreements on employees. And, and, and using forms for that is an invitation to real trouble. I have made probably more money representing people who went online and did it themselves and then three years later or five years later couldn't get along than I would ever imagine making um, on the formation of business entities. Uh, it's sort of a practical reality is um, uh, I don't do my own dental work. And, um, <laughs> and I try really hard not to practice medicine on myself. I try, try really hard not to practice law on myself. Yeah. I try and get <laughs> advice from other people. You certainly can do some of these things online and obviously I've expressed my thoughts about that by making the reference to my own dental work. Um, I would say um, that, that we've covered um, 12 credit hours in 45 <laughs> minutes at the law school. And obviously, we've done that in a pretty particularly superficial way. So hopefully, we've been of some help to people. And maybe you've got some questions you're going to be sending in. Uh, I should add that for certain forms of business entities, as it says here, there may be uh, um, other licensing uh, requirements. If you're starting a daycare center, you can't just form a corporation to do it. There are certain oversights that the state imposes. That's true if you're going to be putting the term education in, in your purpose clause. If you're going to be a school, then you have different regulatory requirements. So this has been very much a, um, a over the very superficial, uh, I'm not sure, 25,000 feet, maybe 22,000 feet view of these things. Um, and, I, and I would say, as it says uh, on the slide, uh, you know, if you have a good idea, you want to protect it, you want to exploit it, you want to find a business structure that's going to work for the particular business vision, and uh, you want to find an attorney uh, or, or a financial, uh, you know, CPA who has your creativity, your, your uh, excitement, and, and your ability to have flexibility so that it can, your you, the structure that you put your vision into has the flexibility that, that you need. Uh, I don't know if you have any final comments. Otherwise, we'll see if we have any what questions are sitting there. Well, I guess I would just say, you know, along the same lines as you don't do your own dental work, the you're buying the expertise to catch those kinds of things. If there is a registration or a licensing issue or if, you know, trademark things that you should look out for. So, you know, going to an attorney just to consult with them and discuss, you know, possibly what your options are, they may recognize things that you might not otherwise find and certainly wouldn't be in those forms online. No, probably <laughs> not on the forms online. But we, we, we're, we're set on questions and we're into it. We've used our hour. So I, I guess uh, we thank everybody for letting us do this, and I hope it's been helpful.